Hey everybody and welcome to another little bonus from Fantastic Fest of Horror Movie Night. And right now I'm talking with Chris, the director of Worm. Uh, one of the, probably my favorite film that I've seen so far at this festival. I've absolutely loved it. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching it. Uh, it so you did something that I absolutely love with this movie. And it's that this film exists in a future. But it's a future that looks like the 80s. But it's not an alternate reality because everything historically that we know absolutely also happened in this future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't quite make sense, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> so where I want to start right with that. Where did where did you come up with this concept of like this pseudo futuristic, but like believably could be in the last ten years, but also super eighties type world? Uh, I. Well, it stemmed from the idea of the collars, which came yeah. first, and then I was like, well, in what world would these collars like seem fun and believable and look the way I want them to look? And I was like, well, it's a combination of kind of how we talked about the internet in the 2000s, but it's the technology of the 80s and 90s, but it can't be exactly those, and I love retrofuturism like as a, a genre in, in general, which is, I think, like the idea that as we get more advanced, it looks more old, and it kind of all mashed up into this thing, and how I was like, a lot of people were like, well, that's not cohesive, blah, blah, blah. Like, that won't work. And to Helen's credit, she was like, no, I, I see how that works. And then we went out and put it all on the screen. And it sounds like hopefully it worked for you and it will for audiences. It's so... And I I'm, I hope you're not offended when I say this, but I think you know this. Like, it's a movie that a lot of people are not going to like, but the audience that loves it is going to be instantly drawn to it. It has kind of that the lobster and Napoleon Dynamite type vibe to it where it's like this isn't for everybody but the people who like it are going to be obsessed with it well uh yeah and I hope that there's an, a lot of those people who yeah. love it <laughs> but yeah 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 I mean it was not we didn't want to write something that was down the middle yeah uh, so that's definitely a fair statement yeah and, and I think that that's you know I was at the screening and the the reaction from the audience was overwhelming they like it was a really great it was a great screening we yeah. were very lucky we were thrilled actually because you know uh, fantastic fest historically is genre festival horror etc and where does something like worm fit in kind of it's a movie that wears its heart on its sleeve and it's a comedy at the end of the day and i was really really thrilled with the response but it's it's one of those it's a comedy about adolescence mm -hmm. you know even if you removed i was thinking about it when i was watching it like if you remove the collars, mm -hmm. which are super central to the plot, but if you remove the collars, it's still just a very charming coming-of-age story about a kid trying to find himself in this world. I'm, yeah, I'm really glad you said that, because that was Helen's whole point when I sent her the first draft of the script. Uh, and she was like, it's not about the collars. And yeah, he, spoiler, he pops it at the midpoint. You can yeah. take that out, but it's obvious it's going to happen to any audience <laughs> member. And guess what? It doesn't fix your life. And he has to deal with all of the emotional baggage, you know, that he's carrying with him across the second half of the film. And that was the design from the beginning. And whenever I met with people about it, the reason I knew Helen was going to be the right fit for it was because I would meet with some people about it. And they'd be like, no, I want more about the technology, more about the college, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, that's not what the movie's really yeah. about. Wow. And I'm glad that you picked up on that. Well, and because it touches on a very real thing, which is... Um, any any a person, I'm not even going to say any boy, any kid knows that for a long period of time, it's, oh, when will I have my first kiss? When will I fall in love? Not knowing that pretty much the second that happens, it gets so much worse and shittier. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah. And I'm glad you said any person, because I think um, we wanted to make sure that it didn't just feel like this is a story for little boys or a story for boys. And instead, I think there's a very strong... Uh, kind of like female experience angle through it with his sister Marcella and then obviously the Lindsay character who he interacts with across the story as well and hopefully I agree it's a universal feeling I mean Helen was remarking at the screening that the not too early not too late concept really resonated with her when she was coming up um, because it's like this tightrope of if I jump in too soon I'm labeled one thing and if I jump in too late I've been left behind you know in some way well, and there's a there's a scene that I I don't want to give too many details because I want people to watch the movie, but there's a moment where Worm is explaining why he didn't visit somebody, mm -hmm. and I don't 
know when the last time was that I relate it to a character that had that same intense anxiety that I have about that type of stuff where, you know, it's like, well, I didn't think it was going to be a big deal. And then when I realized it was a big deal, it was way too late and I felt stupid for even Mm -hmm. being there. So I just hoped you would forget that I like fucked up basically. Yeah. (laughs) I, I, yeah, that anxiety has governed me a lot. Like that's very personal. Um, and that, I mean, that conversation is very pulled from a conversation I I've had before and it uh, I think that that governs a lot of our interactions that feeling of like it's been too long it's awkward now I like I can't handle it the shame and so it's best if we go our separate ways and never yeah. see each other again that's a terrible way to live your life <laughs> but like it's not just when you're a kid no, I'm, I'm still, gonna be, yeah I'm, I'm gonna be 34 in a couple yeah. weeks and I have at least two friends that I desperately miss but yeah. like it feels stupid after two years of not talking to them to just be like, hey, I miss you. It's yeah. incredible. <laughs> like, we build up these kind of emotional and psychic roadblocks, you know, in our relationships that are challenging to get over. You should definitely talk to your friends. I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> this will be the good catalyst. Yeah, this is what catalyst. inspired me. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that resonated because that, that was very personal to me. And I was like, is that, am I the only person who feels this way? Because no. when you write something like that, you don't know if it's going to, you know, hit with people. So let's talk about, I like to, you know, we can talk about the movie a little bit, but most of the people listening haven't seen it yet. So let's talk about an aspect of the movie that I certainly connected with, and I feel like probably was pulled from your life as well. But I used to walk around with a tape recorder just Mm. recording everything and still have boxes of these cassette tapes of eight-year-old me Mm -hmm. just doing like... SNL skits with yeah. friends and stuff. Was that also something you did as a child? Yeah, I love I love sound and I love recording things. And um, I actually studied sound in grad school uh, when I went to film school. Uh, that was my focus. Yeah. Um, and growing up, it was how you shared things. It was it was we would re- torrent you know a comedy sketch off of like LimeWire or something yeah. like that. And like that's how I like would experience visual mediums. Like I would listen. To recordings of movies and I would listen to recordings of like old comedy routines and there is this idea that if you listen to something and close your eyes um, you're actually having the same physical experience as if you were there because of sound the way sound waves work it's the same like physical manifestation and so uh, yeah it definitely came from a personal place and then there's this idea that was important to me where it's if you if someone you love passed away would you rather have a recording of their voice or a photograph of them. Yeah. And I always, to me, the photo, the recording of their voice brings them back to life in a way that a photograph never can. Um, and I used to, I recorded interviews of people when I was younger, and I did one of my mom's dad uh, shortly before he passed away. He was a lot older. Uh, and that interview is on a mini cassette tape, you know, from my dad's dictaphone that we like did through the phone like back in the day. Uh, it'll never see the light of day. There's a little bit, of, there's a couple racist things in there that we got to cut out. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, it was it's that was him, you know. What I mean, we can play it back, and it's like, oh my god, much more than a photograph will ever like, you know, yeah. spring to life. And that, um, I mean, I I totally get that. When my I was very close with my grandfather, which actually, not not to bring down the mood on this recording, but actually today would be the 17 year anniversary of his passing, and he was a musician, and I used to sit and listen to a cassette of him performing yeah. every day after school. Yeah. And then one day I didn't realize that tape was in there and recorded the radio over the entire oh, tape. Oh my and was, god! Yeah, like I I agree with you. Like I can look at photos of my grandfather, but that doesn't put yeah. his voice or his sense of humor back into yeah, my life. Exactly. It's just that that capture gives you nothing of the soul. But then yeah. if you listen to the person, you feel oh like they're god. right there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a very powerful tool, and it's I think that it's definitely people who are wired like sure. us, like. I don't think it's an accident that I spent most of my elementary school years recording audio with my friends right. and now produce five different podcasts yeah. for a podcasting yeah. network. Like there's yeah. very a very clear through line yeah, there. Exactly. And I do think podcasts though are bringing back that idea because through our commutes, the in between moments in our days, we spend our lives listening to other people speak very intimately to us. And I what makes what feels interesting to me about that is I'll run into someone that oh my god I listen to that person's podcast yeah and I I'm like I know this person intimately I'm gonna I want to like go give him a hug and slap him on the back and be like what's up buddy and like they 
they don't know who I am. They, but it's so it's a one way street. But it, it gives you an intimacy with that person that I don't think you get when you're just watching the morning news every day with somebody and you're you're seeing them at a remove. When you have somebody speaking into your ear as you're washing the dishes, you're getting a closeness to that person that I don't think you can get through most visual mediums. I think that there's, um, in a weird way, less vulnerability in audio because I think. People aren't as afraid to speak as they are to yeah. be seen. Yeah. So if you don't, like, I couldn't do a video podcast. Yeah. I know that I would clam up. I know that I would be insecure. But yeah. if it's just my voice and people don't have to necessarily know what I look like or yeah. stop me on the street to talk yeah. about what I've said on a show, yeah. I feel way more willing to open up about my own life and Absolutely. my own stuff. Yeah. And I think that with Worm in the end, too, like that, there's that idea of what are you using the voice for and there's the his you know is it going to be a hagiography of his brother or is it going to be something more honest and i think that that's you know what audio can do as well it can give you like a core honesty like you're saying if you have a camera trained on someone and they know it's hard to let your guard down there's a reason actors are very good at what they do it's a rare person who can get emotional in front of a camera that's i can't could never do that but like you're saying, if you put a recorder in front of me, I would be able to forget about it after yeah. a little bit, of, you know, a short period of time and, and speak emotionally about something. I mean, I feel like that's why the best document, like documentarians will tell you that it takes them like three or four years mm-hmm. of following their subject before they even get the yeah. footage that's real. Yeah. Is that it's a long time for people to forget that there's a thing in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do want to call back one last thing with Worm before we have to wrap up is with Worm... Um, I love that you never spell out what happened with Mm. anything in this world. Like, you're watching and you have to figure out what happened to this family. Mm -hmm. No one outwardly is just like, well, this happened and then that led to this and that's why this person is this way. Like, everything is presented in a normal, conversational way. There is Mm -hmm. almost zero exposition and it's so charming and amazing to me. So kudos on just a great writing of that thank you yeah that was really i don't like exposition dumps in movies and if you can hide your exposition well i think that's like a big badge of honor and so i'm glad that you felt that way um but yeah we also didn't it's a story about a family not talking about an event so that we can't have the family talk about that event (laughs) like that that's the like overarching rule that has to govern everything that's happening for the audience and what's nice is like you said i believe people are emotionally intelligent enough to put the pieces together yeah and so i think we're in good shape then yeah (laughs) (laughs) well where can people see worm is there a social media or anything where they can see where the next festival screening is or anything we're getting all of that going right now um in the short term i would say like follow uh me and helen maybe uh on instagram or twitter um and we are like in the middle of getting the PR th- machine running. Fantastic Fest was our premiere. It's like the first thing we're getting going, and we're just getting started on the distributor front. Um, so we're hoping to have more info on that soon. Helen, anything else? Yeah, hopefully this week we'll know more. Yeah. In the meantime, if you do follow uh, like me or Helen on uh, Twitter or Instagram, just look our names up, we will be putting the information out. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.